Hi. Can you hear me? How's that? Good. Uh, if anybody wants to come up and sit in the front row with us, there's a couple of seats up here. <coughs> Anyone who's brave enough to come to the front row. <laughs> uh, thank you all for joining us uh, this evening. It's really great to be able to continue to host these series of By ThoughtWorks events, uh, and I'm pleased to see a really solid turnout for tonight. Um, it's great to see all of you taking time out to come and join us this evening. Um, I assume most of you are at least somewhat familiar with what ThoughtWorks does, uh, but in a nutshell, ThoughtWorks helps clients use software to become modern digital leaders. Um, one of our key offerings to support that mission is intelligent empowerment and helping businesses unlock and understand their data to help them make better business decisions. Our speaker tonight, Andrew Jones, will be speaking on the topic of data patterns. Uh, and he'll be sharing a range of practical approaches for migrating from monolithic legacy systems to modern architectures and services. Uh, as a self-taught software developer and consultant, Andy has worked in startups, nonprofits, and enterprise environments in a variety of roles. He has a wide range of interests and skills from infrastructure to front-end code. He's very active in the Melbourne DevOps community as the organizer of the DevOps Melbourne Meetup, and he recently founded the Data Engineering Meetup also here in Melbourne. So hopefully we'll see some of you out at those meetups as well. Uh, Andy's most recent roles have required specializing in cloud and data architecture to help organizations unlock the value in their data. These are some of the insights that we'll hear from him tonight. Uh, Andy recently presented on this topic at Sales Sorry, I knew I was going to say that wrong. Sales Conference, it's not that at all. It's Scale Conf New Zealand. Um, and at ThoughtWorks uh, Yadabyte Conference, which was recently held in Beijing. So thank you for joining us again. I hope you've had plenty of pizza and sushi. There's more back there, I'm sure. Um, we'll get into Andy's talk. And if you want to stick around afterwards, there will be some time to ask Andy some questions. And we'll take it from there. Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. Um, how's the sound? Can any, everybody up the back hear me all right? All right, nice one. Okay, thanks everyone for coming. Um, this is a, a, a great turnout, far more than I expected um, on a Tuesday evening in Melbourne, um, especially with the patches of decent weather that we've had. So thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm pretty excited to be, to be talking about, about this stuff. I'm, like, I've been thinking about this stuff for a while now, um, and I'm really keen to hear what you think about it and to just, you know, uh, roll it around and, and see how it is going to fit with your organizations. So um, today we're going to be talking about migrating from a monolith to a modern data architecture. And that kind of operation can be uh, as complex and intricate as open heart surgery. And m maybe that's, um, you'll see the relevance of the, of the background there. Um, in order for you to be able to tackle this kind of tricky procedure, I'm going to give you some tools to help. And we, we're going to cover a few things. Um, first up, we're going to look at some common symptoms that we might see in our own patients. And we'll go over why monoliths might not be serving us as well as they used to and the sorts of pain they might be causing us. Next, we'll offer a diagnosis. We'll try and unpack what a modern data architecture looks like. And finally, we'll take a look at some of the common treatments that you can use for your patient. I'm going to introduce you to the Data Patterns Catalog and walk through some of the ideas in there that'll help you with your migration approach. So, why would we even want to move away from monoliths anyway? Our enterprise monoliths have been around for a long time. Um, we think about mainframes that retailers or financial organizations have had running for 30 or 40 years. They've enabled these businesses to operate relatively smoothly and grow for that whole time. And that's a really impressive achievement. That kind of long-term stability is really hard to get. And we often see a similar story with startups. They usually don't have huge mainframe systems, but they usually start life with a monolith. This allows startups to grow while focusing on their customers without having to develop skills across a whole lot of different capability areas. Like you don't want to be mucking around with infrastructure when you're really trying to focus on what you're offering to your customer. So even if a monolith persists for the first few years or so, that's still a really valuable thing for, for startups. And we also often forget about data monoliths. The enterprise data warehouse pattern was popular for quite a while. It still is really popular. Uh, we'll still, you'll see plenty of those kicking around in organizations. I'm working with organizations today who are still using it. 
And they've usually worked because they're supposed to contain lots of data from disparate data sources from across the organization. They store current and historical data in a single place and they're used for creating analytical reports for workers across an entire organization. Enterprise data warehouses were supposed to allow full access to data without compromising security or data integrity. So monoliths obviously can be useful. So what are the sorts of symptoms we need to watch out for? So you, might, you might recognize some of these. Um, we can usually identify the point at which a monolith becomes a problem. It is when it has become too large to manage effectively. They can reach a point where they're prohibitively expensive to enhance, to fix or maintain. Changes to monoliths can come with unintended consequences because they're so very entangled. You fix something over here and then something else that, that breaks something over here. The teams working on monoliths are often organized horizontally. For example, you might have your middleware team and your DBA team. And that means they're waiting for each other for things to happen. Um, and nothing gets done you know, until, until that team's done their thing. Um, and everybody just ends up waiting all the time for everything. Monoliths also tie to a single tech stack, making it difficult to grow new technologies as they evolve and mature. And due to the size and complexity of the code in these monoliths, it's usually time consuming and therefore expensive to onboard new developers because there's so much to learn. And don't, in this case, don't even think about like bringing on consultants or contractors to do that because it's just gonna cost you a fortune to get nowhere. As monoliths grow, they usually grow a huge database with them, which makes changing your data architecture particularly difficult. Domain entities within these databases often get so tangled up with each other that extracting a single entity from your database becomes a, a nightmarishly difficult exercise and something that we just usually try and avoid, um, which makes the problem even worse. The data warehouse pattern requires organizations to have a single enterprise-wide data model, and those are usually really painfully slow to come up with in the first place and then very slow to change because every time you need to change it you've got to get all your architects and all your data people in a room um, and all your business leaders and and like that happens maybe once a year and then that meeting you know takes weeks and weeks and weeks and then you get something so changes to this to that model they just they don't really happen at all um, in these systems too your storage format is coupled directly to the consumption format which means changes need to be thoroughly vetted so they minimize the changes of breaking everything downstream. And if, if your, your sort of business reporting, your management reporting systems are built on these, you really don't want to break those because that jeopardizes the operational running of your organization and we definitely don't want that. So here's the thing, speed to market is critical for modern, for modern businesses, particularly if you're an aspiring digital organization. These modern digital organizations um, should, be, should be in such a place where data is informing all of your business decisions. So that if you can't get your data quickly and in the right form, then like, the game hasn't even started. So what does a healthy patient look like? What do we want to get out of um, a modern data architecture? So let's say that we're going to start doing some surgery on this patient. We want the system to be able to give us speed to new insights. We want real-time insights, decisions, and reactions. We want rapid feature delivery, and we want to support team scale. They're all, all nice things to have. So how are we going to do that? Um, we want our system to, to be evolvable. We want it to be able to change incrementally. We want to be able to de-risk changes by enabling us to make small bets and perform experiments as opposed to monolithic investment in large-scale projects. You think about these two or three year long projects that you might, you, you might deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. We want to be able to fund pieces of work based of work. Our systems need to be able to support these incremental changes and experiments, and that means small, well-encapsulated, loosely coupled applications. Our system needs to be able to scale as well, both for load and throughput, as well as teams. If we're running our business on data, then we'll need to be collecting increasing amounts of, of it and making it easily available to growing numbers of users. We're also going to want to scale the number of teams working on, on critical systems that channel data. A modern digital business must be technology driven, so we need to grow our, our delivery teams. And if this growing number of teams can't work autonomously without stepping on each other's toes, then that's really going to hurt us. And we're, gonna, we, we're not gonna get the sort of feature throughput that we need. Our systems also need to be reliable. 
Systems are becoming more and more distributed, so our systems need to go beyond simply coping with the myriad of random issues that they can experience. Modern systems need to thrive in this unreliable, massively distributed environment. And we need to have data integrity. We need to know that our data is correct. We don't want to think about the impact to our businesses if humans and machines are making decisions based on incorrect data. We need to be able to trace our data back to its source, track it through enrichment or derivation, and know that we've still got solid data. Ultimately, we want our applications and our overall systems to be better than the ones we have today, more robust, more correct, and evolvable. So, onto the treatment. What does a modern data architecture actually look like? We're going to go through an emerging collection of principles and patterns. Um, we're starting to see these ideas take hold more and more um, across more and more businesses because we can use them to drive us towards the, the evolvable, scalable, reliable, and correct systems that we need. So the, these are the, the very high-level patterns. Um, first one, asynchronous events. As asynchronous events are great for decoupling and modularizing your architecture. This is closely related to the application architecture pattern, event sourcing, uh, where we communicate changes in state as small immutable events. An event is a small self-contained immutable object that contains details of something that happened at some point in the past. Events should contain a timestamp to indicate when it happened. And we can store events in an event store that is append only, so updates or deletes are strongly discouraged or even just don't appear in some systems. Events are designed to reflect things that happen at the domain or business level rather than as low-level state changes. So for example, we might store the event, attendee cancelled their, their tickets for the Buy ThoughtWorks event on the 23rd of October, um, and that, that event clearly states the intent of a single action that relates very strongly to our domain, which is in this case selling tickets. Whereas the side effects, one entry deleted from the allocated tickets table and one cancellation reason was added to the feedback table, that embeds a lot of assumptions about the way the data is going to be used. If we want to add a new feature, say, to allow the tickets to be offered automatically to the next person on the waiting list, the event sourcing approach allows that, site, that new effect to be easily chained off the original event, rather than having to encode all the new logic that was coupled to the original implementation. Next up is immutable log-based streaming. These things are great for simplifying your data pipelines. It provides everything that needs data a single place to get that data from. Apache Kafka is the poster child of this space, but there are plenty of other options for a myriad of use cases, such as AWS Kinesis or you know, things like Google Dataflow or, or any of those. Um, immutable log-based systems can also give us loose coupling, which I'll, I'll get into in a bit more detail shortly. And lastly, we're going to talk about, very quickly, microservices. So, microservice architectures, models, applications as a suite of small services that are independently deployable and scalable and are organized around business capabilities. They enable teams to build in the most appropriate languages and frameworks and to work autonomously and independently. This style of architecture is great for growing an engineering organization. So there's a, a fantastic case of engineering organization growth that came out of Uber a few years ago. They went from a couple of teams to about 2,000 developers you know, in a in about two years, I think, um, with, this style of, um, with this style of architecture. It grew into like thousands of thousands of services, which became another problem, but in order to get, like to support that many people working you know, on, the, on the code base, like that, that's a kind of impressive achievement and supported by the technology. So none of those are particularly new ideas, like some of those have been around for a really long time. Um, the new part is doing them all together. What we're seeing here is a convergence of microservices and data. Um, so our application architectures have kind of smooshed up against our data architectures. So we don't, we used to have our data stuff over here and you know, data specialists working over there kind of by themselves and you know, trying to hoover data out of wherever they can get it. And then our sort of application, um, you know, business capability delivery teams over here, you know, screwing away serving business needs and they, they never really talk to each other except when somebody needs data. But what, we don't have that anymore. What we have is just a bunch of small services that need to shunt a lot of data around. So that means like traditional, traditional data over here architectures, they're not gonna work anymore. So what the key idea here that enables all of that when we 
start doing events and streaming and you know, all these small services that need it, is we can, we can take advantage of this idea of unbundling the database or turning the database inside out. And this, this was a, uh, an idea originally posited by Jay Kreps, who was one of the founders of Kafka, um, runs a company Confluent, and Martin Kleppman, who's a, a big data researcher, um, whose book you should read if you're interested in data stuff at all. So two smart people sort of have coined this term. Um, so what, what this gives us is a kind of database that, um, that services can share, which sort of on, on the surface might seem a bit scary um, and kind of the opposite of what we want to do. You know, best practice says we don't, we don't reach into anyone else's database, but this is a bit different. Um, unbundling the database actually um, avoids strong coupling and shared mutable state, which, act, which comes from the simple interface that the unbundled database provides. We can only seek and we can scan, and that's it. Um, anything else like goes into um, database integration territory, which is, which is bad news. But in this case, the only coupling comes from the data itself, which is kind of exciting. So we can start to use that loose coupling to extra advantage. We can unbundle the database and allow different components of our systems to be developed, maintained, and improved independently from each other. Sounds a lot like a microservice architecture. And that enables them to be worked on by different teams. Events can provide a stable, well-defined interface to other team systems. Asynchronous event streams also make the whole system more robust to outages or performance degradation of individual components. If a consumer runs slow or even fails, the event log can buffer messages, allowing producers and other consumers to continue running unaffected. The dodgy consumer can catch up when it becomes healthy, and it won't miss any messages. And when we layer, when we layer a query layer over the top of this log, services can still retain control of what queries are run, the hardware they run it on, and what transformations are applied to create the views, and more importantly, when and how these things are changed. It's this level of control when compared with a traditional centralized database that keeps services nimble and agile. When a service needs to release, all the highly coupled pieces are already inside its deployable unit, and only the data itself is shared. So that, that's sort of the key idea behind this uh, unbundling of the database. So if, that, if that's what we're working towards, um, we've, I'm going to give you some of the tools that we can use to move towards this sort of architecture. This is the Data Patterns Catalog, or a collection of maneuvers, concepts, and guides for building your own data platform roadmap. This is something I've been working on for a while. It's still in the works, but even now, there are hopefully some useful things in there that you can start using today. The key idea here is that when you're moving to an event-driven architecture, it gives you a few more levers you can pull when you're planning your roadmap and your, your complex migrations. <coughs> some of you will have come across some of these patterns before, but they might be a little bit different uh, when working in this style of architecture. So hopefully, you'll be able to use this to come up with your own plan for treating your patient without stopping the blood flow. So first up, we've got the classic strangler pattern. Uh, you might be familiar with this if you spent any time working in object-oriented languages, um, particularly if you've read any of Martin Fowler's refactoring work. We, we're going to take this idea and then just apply it at the macro level. We're going to but it's, it's, it's exactly the same in principle. So starting out, we've got a monolith, and we need to extract a capability from it. So in that case, it's, sort of, it's, a, it's a set of components that, that, you know, that relate to a particular business, business function. Um, it's quite similar in concept to a, uh, to a bounded context, if, if, you've done any, if you've read the big blue DDD book. Um, so what we're trying to do here is we've got an app that we want to push into a different bounded context, or it belongs to a different capability. Um, or the monolith is being phased out due to you know, some sort of infrastructure, license, or other reasons, but the app should live in the current context. Like for example, your mainframe is too expensive now, and you want to you move things off it. So this, this can help us with that. Um, the strangler pattern allows, allows us to sort of enable continuous service while the new, the new app is being built, and gradually the new app can take on performing the tasks of that component in the monolith. We favor the strangler pattern with external facades for situations where it is hard or undesirable to change the original service. Without the strangler pattern, migrations tend to happen in a big bang, like all the migration happens at once. With the strangler pattern, we can eliminate some of that risk associated with moving to a new version of the service by enabling it much sooner and in run it in conjunction with the old version of the service. And it also enables quick rollback if things go wrong. So just to, we're gonna step through a really 
sort of trivial example of this just to show sort of how it works um, at, at this macro level. So we've got, if this, this, this big, big thing, that's our, that's our monolith. We've got you know, some, some unit of functionality in there that we want to extract. Um, and it talks to two, two things outside. Um, it's sending data to a somewhere and it gets data from somewhere. Um, so our goal is to get that, that little one inside the monolith out. So first up, we're going to put, um, we're going to put an, we call it a, a, an event gateway in there, but it's really just a, all it does is um, it copies a, some sort of input um, or output and sends it to somewhere else. So in this case, it's just all it does to start with is it gets what was coming out of the, out of the monolith and forwards that on, and it takes whatever was coming in and forwards it on. Nothing, nothing flashy yet. What the, the trick comes here where we, all we do is we copy the data that's coming in, we, we deploy our new service, um, it's, and start copying that stream of you know, whatever, be it a, a, a file-based um, data packet or you know, sort of an HTTP sort of um, data package, whatever it is, we're, we're just gonna copy that out to the new, like the, the thing that we're trying to extract. Um, the, the, the chunk in the mainframe is still doing the work and it's still the thing we trust, but we can start, we can start working and testing the, uh, the new thing that's coming out as we go. Then we can, our, our event, event stream appears um, or an event sausage as it, it kind of resembles here. Um, once, once we've got data coming in, we can actually start to, we can start to push events. Um, our new version of the service starts to push events onto the event stream. And they're not doing anything yet, they're just there. Um, they're happy little events, just on their way. Once we get, like we've built up enough trust in that, we can actually start, communic something else can start reading those events. Uh, and this, this is where this decoupling comes in. Um, the, a new version of the service is has published these events, and then our receiver is going to start reading those events. It doesn't have to, doesn't have to act on those yet. We can wait until we've actually we can do some uh, parity testing inside inside this receiver to make sure that the data coming in from here matches the new data coming in. And when we've got that, um, we can actually break. Like we can switch we can switch this thing off. Um, the feed coming directly from our mainframe component, um, the, the, the sending service can just send data to the new version of our system, and then, and then we take the gateway and the original mainframe component away. So that, that's kind of a very trivial example, but that's kind of how it works in practice when you do this. Um, the, the, the pieces are, are, are just bigger than what we would have done in, a, in, our, in our Java apps back in the day. So if we build on that, like if we take that, that basic idea, we can use, um, like if, we, if we can actually change the monolith, um, another option we have is to, to be able to identify event seams, which are places in the monolith that change state relating to particular entities. If we modify the monolith code to publish an event at the same time as the change is written to a database, then we can start consuming those events really early. The event has started to become our interface that other components can depend on. And as long as that interface is fulfilled, we can move that code that produces that event to anywhere we like. So it can be in the, in the mainframe, like in our, in our monolith, um, or, or it can be somewhere else. Like it's literally, we can just pick it up and move it um, if it was that easy. Um, but once we've got that interface, things become very shiftable. So this is a, a batch to event adapter. Um, so once you can establish the source of truth in an event stream for a particular entity, so you've got enough, enough data coming in to represent you know, the entire life cycle of a, of a particular entity, um, but at least partial responsibility for that entity is in a service that only deals in batches, especially file-based batches, and can't be changed easily. So for example, a, you know, a, um, an off-the-shelf product that you're using. We can start um, by, batch, uh, by proxying that batch using a migration gateway um, so that downstream services are not affected. And then we can, 
create one of these, a batch to event adapter that receives the batch dump, translates that into individual events and pushes them onto the event stream. So here's, here's our situation. We, don't wanna, we, don't, we can't change the producer easily, so it's just gonna hang out there on its own, but we can, um, we wanna enable, uh, we wanna change this batch consumer to an evented consumer. So it's receiving individual events and being able to respond sort of in, in real time, potentially. So first thing we'll do is we'll put one of these uh, gateways in between, and all it's gonna do is just proxy, proxy what it gets and, and send it on. What we do here is we're gonna do that, that, that magic copying again. We're gonna start forwarding that, that batch file to a batch to event adapter. And then that batch event adapter will start producing events at some point. So we've got our event stream. Um, then what we can do, once we've got sort of enough trust in the events coming out of that batch to event adapter, we can start consuming them in this, in this batch consumer which we should stop calling the batch consumer at this point because it's, it's starting to consume events. Once we've, got, once we've done enough testing in this thing to know that the read model it's built from uh, consuming this event, the event stream, you know, as well as the batch files, we can, we can start thinking about getting rid of, um, sort of getting rid of this direct connection between these two things. So we've got, this has this is ceased to become a batch consumer and it's now an event stream consumer and our batch consumer is sitting happily over there, doesn't know a thing about the world of events. So it is, is very isolated. Um, if you know the uh, domain driven design terminology, the batch to an event adapter is a bit, is, um, is kind of like a, an anti-corruption layer um, here. It's, it's shielding the rest of the world from its, like from domain um, corruption. We can also go back the other way. So we've got source of truth in some event stream for a particular entity, but we've also got services that consume that evented data that only deal in batches um, and can't be changed easily. So this is likely to occur when we're extracting a new event producing service from a legacy monolith. We can create an app that builds a read model of the entity from the event stream. And on a schedule appropriate to the consumer, the app can send a batch of all the events since the last transmission. This would look, so we've got, we've got our monolith here, we've got some, some capability in here called B um, that is communicating with A, which is producing events. Uh, we've also got C over here. We're looking to, to, to get rid of this connection, to decouple these things. So what we're gonna do first is, so we've, we've already got the events, we're gonna start to build up a separate read model here. It, it hangs out on its own, it's a bit independent. Um, but what we can start to do here is again, we can do that parity testing to make sure that the data that we're getting from here sort of matches, the, matches in both these places. Um, then we, can, we, start, we start to feed that data into service C um, and, and we can turn off the feed between B and C. So we've, we've isolated, so A deals in events, C deals in, in in whatever it needs to, and B, um, the connection between B and our potentially corrupting system C, that, that's been isolated. So again, this, this read model is, is acting a little bit like a, like a, a, a corruption barrier. So th those are some nice Is a, is a whole lot of governance, uh, which is often a, a, a pretty scary thing. Um, it's pretty desirable for us to enable this to be done in a, in a really self-service manner. So as we know, if a team wishes to start producing events and they have to wait for a, a ton of approvals and modeling and blah, 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 then they're gonna slow down and we're gonna have lost any market advantage that we might have uh, been able to gain. So two of the first capabilities that you might want to implement to enable self-service data governance are a data catalog and a schema registry. So first off, we need to use some sort of sch schema to describe the structure of our events down to the fields and data types. Whether some piece of data conforms to a schema can be checked at different points in the data's lifecycle. We can also make assertions about the compatibility of a particular change to a schema for downstream consumers. 
And there are plenty of options to choose from. Some of them include Avro, Parquet, Protobuf, and Thrift. I'm quite fond of Avro. Um, Avro separates the ideas of a writer schema and a reader schema. For any given schema, they don't have to be exactly the same, they just have to be compatible. This opens up a world of joy for us when we want to evolve the structure of a particular event type. This is, there are certain checks we can perform on our schemas to infer that a change we've made will be safe for our consumers. And we can do this in sort of local development. We can compare, like we can change our schema and compare it to the old one, and the tools will tell us whether this is likely to be compatible or not. We can put that in CI or you know, add in our continuous delivery pipelines to actually fail deployment of a new producing service if, if the compatibility doesn't meet what, we, what our organization needs. And that, that's a really powerful thing. So we're starting to automate the, 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 quality, the quality checking. We're pushing responsibility for, for data quality, for data cleanliness back out to, our, to individual teams rather than being centralized in, in, some, in some data team or some governance team. So building on that, we can, we can start to build up a data catalog, which is a, a really key element of a data platform. Um, which enables discovery and maintenance of those data sets. Key functions of the data catalog could include um, to expose metadata, including freshness, access metrics, and provenance. We can allow creation and updating of metadata. We can provide access control for metadata and data sets. We can provide sampling or raw access to data. We can allow search of metadata, and we can uh, perform governance of required metadata fields. The schema registry provides more detailed information about the specific structure of the data in the event stream. Key functions of the event registry are to provide a data shape for events in the data stream, and for use by operational systems, for instance, for data serialization and deserialization. Um, what we can do is separate, like when we push our events onto the event stream, we can actually take off um, the, the separate the schema from the data, um, put the the schema somewhere which enables us to really make our, our events really, really, really small, which gets them going much, much quicker. Um, so we can fire them, get them to where they need to go really quickly and then deserialize them when they get to where they need to go, which, which can speed things up a lot. Um, we can also, developers, um, analysts and data scientists can also use the schema registry um, to, to give them you know, particular detail as they, you know, they, they found a data set and, and want to know what's in it to, to start to figure out if, if it's actually useful for them. Um, and our schema registry can also have metadata about schema um, at, for specific fields within each schema, um, including provenance. So the event stream can, should uh, enforce conformance to the schema registry, preventing ingestion of events with schemas that are not in the schema registry or that have inadequate metadata, which helps when defining an integration contract between services. If you set up some kind of mapping of event types to topic and streams, for example, like if you have one schema per topic or stream, the schema registry can provide some sort of discovery mechanism. And what I've seen at a few organizations is like we just have a, a really simple method of topic naming um, to, to, uh, to make it really clear like which events belong to which, which services and which, it, which namespaces or which you know, domains. So um, another Another thing we've seen a growing interest in recently is change data capture, which is the process of, of observing all data written to a database uh, and extracting them in a form which can be replayed in other systems. Change data capture is particularly interesting to us if the changes are streamed at the same time as they are written to the originating database. For example, we could capture the changes in a database and continually apply them to a search index. So we're building up a search index kind of magically as we're building up the original um, index. If the log of changes comes through in the same order as the original writes, as we'd get with our log-based event stream, we would expect the data in the search index to match the data in the original database. All of these secondary indexes and all other derived data systems just become consumers of, of the change stream. So they're, they're no different to any other application that would sit and read, read events. I've been reason, recently using this as a, at a client to extract data from the source you know, from a, uh, it's got a, a lot of very rich, useful information to the organization and transform what is about 14 different tables, uh, the changes from those, using stream processing tools to convert that into a valuable domain event. Sort of rolls it up and just presents a nice sort of sales uh, event. 
And there are plenty of tools that do this. You're not locked into any, any particular technology. We've got Debezium and Maxwell for MySQL, Bottled Water for, for PostgreSQL, Golden Gate for Oracle, and plenty of others for other platforms. Kafka Connect also has an API um, in which you can plug a streaming data provider, like a change data capture uh, adapter. So there are, there are a lot of open source CDC tools that make it easy to get started producing change events from a database onto an event stream. So if, if a traditional database mutation uh, transaction mutates several objects in a database, it's usually difficult to tell after the fact what that transaction actually means. Even if you capture the transaction logs, the insertions, updates, and deletes in various tables, it doesn't necessarily give you a clear picture of why those changes were made. The invocation of the application logic that constructed those changes in the first place is transient, and it cannot be reproduced. So good luck debugging it. Event-based systems, on the other hand, can provide much better auditability. In the event sourcing world, any change to the system is modeled as a single immutable event, and any resulting state updates are derived from that event. The derivation should be deterministic and repeatable, so the running of the same log of events through the same version of the derivation code should yield the same state. And that, that's, a, that's a really powerful thing to be able to replay, replay your state up to a point, like for, for debugging or you know, for, 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 for audit, auditing, anything like that. That makes the provenance of data much clearer. Data integrity becomes much more feasible to check because we can you know, if we've, we're trying to debug something, we can figure out if it was in the code, you know, that derived the data, or where it was in the data. Like, we can actually tell that um, with this sort of system. For the event log, we can use hashes to check for corruption. And for any derived state, we can repeat that processing to see if the resulting state is the same, or, you know, run, run the same processing in parallel. This sort of determinism makes it easier to debug and trace the execution of the system as a whole in order to understand why something happened in the case where something, something unexpected occurred. In this event-driven world, we can also think of, um, about stream processing like Unix pipes. We pass streams in, we get streams out. We're defining single units of responsibility. And this allows us to derive or enrich by composition. We can do small units of change and then just compose them together rather than having to do one chunk of thing, repeat some of that um, and, and build on that in um, a way which is, is a trap that we've fallen into when we build ETL pipelines sometimes. So just to give you an example, this is one of the, one of the ways that we can join, join two streams. Don't get stuck in the detail here, but this, this looks like SQL, and that's kind of deliberate. This is KSQL um, that has come out of, out of the Kafka world. All we're doing here is we're saying, take this stream, take some stuff on it, join it to this other stream, and create a new stream. Like that, that's all we're doing. This is, this is a join of two, two separate data entities in real time as they come down the pipe. Um, and, we, and we get a new stream out the other side that is, you know, is, represents something useful to us. This is, this is the sort of composability that we get. We could then take that, that third stream and you know, join it to something else you know, a, as we go. And we haven't lost the original, um, the original data. It's still there in those topics as well. So we can continue to, to, to use them to do interesting things. So this, this, all of this is to say that our existing data tools don't go away. Just putting in um, event streaming doesn't get rid of uh, doesn't get rid of your databases. Unbundling the data doesn't remove the need for databases in their current form. This is still like we've still got to. If you want to query that data, if you want to analyze the data, if you want to crunch through it in a really fast way, um, you know, to do complex filters and things, um, an event stream is not going to be able to do that for you. You're going to have to pull that into something like a, that enables you to do that. In the, in the way that you need to do it. But using things like the change data capture so you can play events into, into, some, um, into some data tool, be it a database or you know, another, another stream processing library or something that will generate a batch for you that you can operate on, those, those become even more useful and more powerful in this environment and they, they definitely don't go away. So the skills you have using those things, still useful. So your graph databases, your relational databases, your other like no SQL flavors, um, your, your Hadoops, like your HDFSs, all of that still useful, still necessary in this, in this environment. 
We've got all those big data systems. We've got we've got our event streams. We've got this architecture composed of you know piles and piles of these things, um, but we still can't inherently trust them. Um, we cannot guarantee that every piece of hardware is fault free, nor that every piece of software is bug free. We need to periodically run end to end verification of our data for integrity, reliability, and auditability. If we don't check, we won't find out about corruption until it is way too late and has potentially caused significant downstream damage. If that happens, it can be really expensive and almost impossible to track down the problem. End-to-end -end data integrity checks will help us exercise the breadth of technology that supports our data. The more systems that we can include in the check, the fewer opportunities there are for corruption to go unnoticed. If we can check an entire derived data pipeline is correct from end to end, then all the disks, network services, and algorithms along the path will be included. And ideally, this checks will be run in a continuous fashion so we can increase our confidence in the correctness of our system, which helps us to move fast. And this sort of this ties into you know, this emerging idea of observability. We, we don't, we've got all these big systems, we can't see what's inside, and trying to debug in that you know, massively distributed, highly complex, highly um, in, in that environment just becomes impossible. So if we've got these, these sort of end-to-end -end data integrity checks running and we're emitting, so we've instrumented that code and that, that is, is shipping out to somewhere, if something suddenly starts to fail and we've got data about what went wrong, we can immediately drill down into what, into what happened. So sort of trust but verify plus observability gives us really good insight rapid response into debugging our systems. But that, that's a whole nother talk. Um, we can talk about sort of applying observability to, to data. Maybe come, if that sounds interesting to you, uh, maybe come to the data engineering meetup. Um, so we've, we've touched on this idea of reprocessing um, as well. This, sort of the, this idea is that we can take any, any set of events and then replay them through, through another, another system. That's great for auditability, for checking you know, to be able to check that the code that we had sort of generates the same result, to check for, for data corruption or for just bugs in the code um, to nail down that sort of what was giving us the issue. But we can also use it to, to do for intentional changes in our code. If we if we've, say we've built a system that cares about like three attributes in a user's profile and suddenly we make a change to the business that suddenly cares about their iCar, for example. We didn't process, like we've got nothing that processes that yet. We can actually change, change you know, our code, um, deploy a new version, then rerun the entire stream back through that to now care about, you know, to care about eye color. That, that's, a, that's a really powerful thing. We don't, we've just made a small addition to something we already have. We haven't had to build a new system to consume all that data. We're just replaying data back through our system. That, that's, that's just a, like that's, that's an, actually a really amazing thing, just to be able to, same, same code, we've already got the processes to play the data, we just tick it right back to the start and run through again. And that's just, if we're building microservices out of these things, it's, we're running it through this one little corner here, which doesn't have any impact on any of the other things running in, running our service, uh, which I've now sort of built things um, that use this in a, few, in a few systems and it's amazing. For, for that debugging use case and for that adding extra, um, extra functionality. So that, that's, a, that's a lot of stuff to get through. Um, the good news is there's, like I'm, I'm working on a written version of this, so you can sort of, you can look at it and, and poke through it and, um, uh, you know, and hopefully it'll be useful to you in your organization. So keep an eye out for that. Um, I'll probably, uh, if, if my kids ever give me time, I'll probably, announce it at a, um, at a data engineering meetup soon. So speaking of which, would you like to talk more about data architecture and data engineering and data platform patterns and things like that? Uh, I, I might have a thing for you. Um, I have uh, recently launched the Data Engineering Melbourne meetup. Uh, our first, first event is gonna be here um, on the 14th of November, that's a Wednesday night, 6 p.m. Um, if you want more information, you can go there. But if this was at all interesting, I suspect uh, you will, the, the content there will interest you. I think we have a um, first talk is building a data platform in AWS um, and another talk uh, might be um, about what, what is a data engineer, what, should, what skills should they have. So um, hopefully that'll be interesting to you. Otherwise, that's it, thank you.
I think we've got time for, for questions. So um, if anyone has a question, I've got a mic here. Um, oh, one here and then one there. Okay, thank you for this presentation. It's on. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your presentation. It's uh, really, uh, for me, it's uh, something new. I'm learning uh, good things about the data. I saw it from a different perspective. Uh, what I want to, do, uh, to ask you really about this concept is that I, I, I really, throughout your explanation, mm -hmm. I found that there are some similarities between what you explained and between the enterprise uh, middleware platforms. Mm -hmm. So in a large degree, uh, the middleware can uh, do things, a, a lot of these patterns, uh, and make reprocessing, uh, capture events, mm -hmm. uh, try to uh, make buffering, uh, all of these things. Mm -hmm. So how this will be different from the enterprise middleware? So, so the main idea is that like there is usually a lot more um, functionality shoved into your enterprise middleware products. All the event stream is is like you really the way you interact with it is you give it data and then you get data out. That's it. Um, everything else is in the clients, um, and that's where the, the the flexibility really comes from. You've got your decisions, technological decisions made by the consumers and the producers rather than by this tool in the middle. That's that, I think that's the big difference and the big, um, I think, a, a, a game changer. Thanks. Hi, um, so I think that was a really great talk. Thanks for that. Um, so some of your strategies, so for example, the batch to event adapters and vice versa, mm -hmm. does that actually happen in productions? And if, it's, and if it does actually happen in productions, how do you strategize or plan for them? And when do you actually cut them off? How do you decide that? So when you, um, when you plan for them is when you start thinking you know, about moving, moving pieces around. So we're building a new thing over here, or we want to you know, cut this feed here. It's at, it's at that point, like when we're planning uh, when we're planning out our sort of architecture roadmaps. Um, when we turn them off, like this, this is the key idea, and I'm not sure it came through strongly enough, but the, the idea of when you turn them off is when you've got complete trust in those systems. So you've got verification that the new process that you've built on this sort of consuming or producing events matches what you're doing with the old one. So we can sort of run automated parity checking. Sort of in times past, we'd have someone like a data engineer or a tester come in and do manual reconciliation. Like that, that might be a concept that you know, your organizations do is reconciliation. This is the automated version of that. So you've got, your system is telling you, I, I match like what, what was coming before. And you know, that's the point where we've got confidence to turn it off. You know, it might be a week, a month, whatever, but whatever our you know, confidence level needs to be, like we've got sort of, you know, actual verification. Any more questions? Yep, one here. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm not a data engineer, so I probably don't know what I'm talking about, but you mentioned end-to-end -end testing. Mm -hmm. um, I, maybe in not so much detail, but how do you usually go about doing an end-to-end -end test? Uh, is it through your existing production systems, or do you just test um, the, the functions work, is it a fast test or is it a slow test? Does it go through a CI pipeline? That sort of thing. So the, in this case, like, so we would want to do all those kinds of testing. In the same way, our, this data stuff is still software engineering. We apply all our software engineering practices at all times. So you know, our, our, our processing functions, our production or our consuming functions, we can, we can test those in isolation. You know, we can give it known data, you know, and they will run as fast tests, and, that, and that's great. Um, the end-to-end -end tests, are, they're really, like we're pushing into this idea of testing in production. Um, the only way we can know that our production system doesn't have faults if it, if it tells us it doesn't have faults. The only way we can do that is to, is to, to run check. So it's very similar to this idea of monitoring um, or, um, or observability, where we're you know, constantly exercising uh, different parts of the system. Um, so it can be, based on, like we can inject synthetic data, so sort of test data into the production system and pick it up at different points. We can you know, consume it, we can test the latency on it. We can test that every piece of data that we emitted came out the other end, so at least we've got an idea that something is working. We can instrument a, 
um, an, another data set, a valuable data set. You know, so if you're a retailer, you might instrument your sales data because that's sort of the engine, a measurement of the engine of your, of your business. Uh, you can tag that to make and, and then do checks that match, like, you know, for a sample of sequences that um, you get that e everything within that sequence appears, that the latency is, is low enough um, to support the other, you know, bu uh, the other functions, you know, that need to process that. Um, we can just emit an event and make sure it l goes all the way into our analytics system. So there are different flavors of these, but yes, we would definitely run them in production. Thank you. Thanks. Any more questions? Uh, there's one here and then we'll go over there. So, so uh, as we are introducing like events, queues and everything, mm -hmm. so does it impact the overall performance of the system? Like we are adding, we are running the existing application, and we are adding new, like uh, incrementally, which is good. But it it will impact the performance of the existing system as well, right? It it, it depends. It depends what you're optimizing for. So, yeah, you know, I've built systems that um, that need, like that actually go that aim for better performance with the event in the event streaming model, um, because you push. These things can, like if you take Kafka, you can support massive data throughput on that thing at, at very, very low latency. Um, and if you take advantage of the, the Kafka TCP protocol, um, that gets your data packets really small. Um, and if you use Avro on top of those, so you, you get into this idea of separating the schema from the message um, and just putting the message through, like you can really, you can build very, very fast systems and very responsive systems using this. Um, if you're syncing events into a like into a mainframe database that can only process things very slowly, like that's that like you're limited by you know how you like how you read these things. So, yet yeah, depending on how on what you're talking to on what your sort of consumption requirements are, yes, it might it might make things slower. But in most cases, there's a way to make it to make it faster, or at least just sort of keep up with match what the rest of the system needs to do. So you uh, mentioned about the best practice to follow while converting monolithic to a microservice architecture, mm -hmm. like take one bit, add event, uh, queue, and things like mm -hmm. that. Are there any traps that we should avoid or like look for while converting monolithic to microservice? And the second question is, like as you mentioned, there could be thousands of microservices. How we handle the maintainability of those services? So that so second one first maintainability of, of a gigantic fleet of microservices. I wouldn't recommend going from zero, like from one thing that you're looking after from one monolith to a thousand. Like that that's probably a bad idea. Um, you like there's a lot of talks on on how you should approach sort of a microservices transition. Um, there are a bunch of requirements that you need to meet in order to be able to sustain that kind of thing. You know you've got very good infrastructure practices, very good sort of automation, infrastructure automation practices, a really good DevOps culture, a really good sort of build and run, like there's a lot of things, you know, going on there to, to make that work. Um, in the, on, on the traps um, would be going after a microservices architecture when you're not ready. Um, we don't need um, we don't need to, to move immediately to you know five things in you know in the place of one. We can move to two things first, and then you know and then to three things. Like we should go in that sort of a, a way. Um, so microservices stuff aside, the traps that you can fall into are um, are getting getting the events wrong. Um, this sort of building. In my experience, getting building the right sized events with the right things in them um, is tricky. Is tricky to start with. So if you lock yourself into a coupling, you know, on event structure to start with, then like it's going to be quite painful and um, will take quite a long time to get used to. So um, to avoid the, you know that particular trap, I would sort of do a lot of sort of work with, with teams who are starting to do this on, on designing events and thinking about events and event modeling. Um, There's a great technique uh, called event storming, which will model your, your domain as, as events. Um, 
you know, and you'll find that a lot of a lot of domains, you know, sort of think about things in, in events quite naturally. You know, when we talk about um, like in, in retail, like we think about shipping shipping an order. Um, we, we say the order was placed, the order, like we, you know, assembled the order, we shipped the order. Like that's how people talk. They use that sort of past tense. So they're describing events already. Um, another one, um, so there, there are a few different types of event sort of transmission as well. So picking the wrong one, you know, can be a trap as well. So they're, they're Taking on uh, responsibility for running Kafka when you when you don't have really really good infrastructure practices like that you're in for a world of pain. There, it is a very complex beast to run. Um, there are plenty of ways you can get Kafka without having to run it yourself. I would definitely look into that before you like before you embark on Kafka. You know, in feeding that. So there are, there are, they're the big ones, the big traps that I've seen. Thank you. Um, Uh, the way that you described a monolith uh, was largely true. One of the things that often is in places that they're uh, nigh impossible to make change in. Do you have a data pattern that honours or respects the monolith whilst introducing new functionality mm -hmm. outside of that? Yeah. So um, the the ones um, the the one the um, the batch to event type model where we've got. You know, it doesn't have to be batch to event. It's just something something contained within a monolith that we can, we can't change very easily. Um, so we we can um, we can convert like the input and output of that into you know into an evented form without like without changing anything um, in that. And depending on the type of monolith, that can be like that might be impossible. Um, but we can like we might leverage things like change data capture there to, to read changes as they're emitted to the database um, and, and feed, feed events from that rather than from you know, having to go in and change the application logic or change where it gets data from or sending data to. So there are, there are things like that. Sometimes um, we, might, we might do something like just putting an API in front of, um, in front of a, a monolith. I've seen this work quite well with mainframes, which are, which, you know, are, are often very expensive um, to fix, um, so that means we've suddenly got data access now through this through this other thing, um, which can you know make sure we don't clobber clobber the the monolith. Um, so so um, there there are there are a few sort of overall patterns, but you know there are specific like there are some monoliths that are so complicated and so um, um, so un untouchable, you know, unchangeable that um, it, it can be quite tricky and you know, not, not all of these patterns work all the time. Does that sort of, sort of make sense? <laughs> yeah. Uh, any, any other questions before we uh, finish up? All right. Great, thank you. That was obviously a very uh, robust discussion afterwards, so thank you for your questions. Um, and certainly for your time this evening, and we hope that you will join uh, Andy at his data meetup, his data engineering meetup, coming soon. Um, thanks very much, and enjoy your evenings, and thank you to Andy. Thanks, folks. <laughs> <laughs>